Hey everyone, this is Nick Dearbertis teaching you financial modeling. Today, we're going to be talking about applying forecasting to free cash flows specifically. This is part of our lecture series on free cash flow estimation and forecasting. So we've had a number of videos going over general forecasting, uh, how to forecast basically any kind of time series whether that be statement line items, free cash flows, or whatever else. Um, but here we're, we're trying to take it to specifically applying these general forecasting techniques in the context of future free cash flows. So we have two general ways to go about forecasting these free cash flows. One is to look at his, the historical free cash flows and do the forecast on those. And the other is to forecast the entire financial statements and then calculate the future free cash flows from those forecasted financial statements. Generally, uh, you're almost always going to want to forecast the financial statements. Um, with a big reason being that when you just forecast the free cash flows, you don't really have any flexibility. Uh, you know, you can just adjust it up or down, but it's not really clear, um, you know, how the operations translate into the free cash flows directly. Um, whereas it's easier to say, um, well, the, the company is opening a new branch. Uh, they have 20 branches. Now they're going to have 21, so maybe we'll see like up to an additional 5% sales bump. Um, so you can't easily just put that into a free cash flow number without doing this full forecast of the full financial statements. Um, and the other reason that generally forecasting the statements is preferred is because free cash flows can be very noisy and irregular. If you look at the history, it may be that in one year they bought a big building, and so that year has way lower free cash flows than all the other years. Um, and because these large capital expenditures can really shift the free cash flows, it's uh, a difficult exercise to try and get a good look at the future free cash flows only from the historical free cash flows. Now, if it's been very stable in the past, and the company doesn't have any big planned capital expenditures, then it, it might be an okay approach. Um, so under those conditions, and especially when you just need to quickly get together a model and you don't have time to go through this full financial statement forecasting approach, um, that can be another reason to go with it. Um, but generally, it's not preferred. Um, where it is helpful to do that, free cash flow direct forecast is if you've already done your financial statement forecast, you've already calculated future free cash flows from that, then you can just also do this as a check on the side. Well, what if I just directly forecasted the historical free cash flows? How similar does that look to my new calculated ones? So uh, the preferred approach, as we said, is to forecast the entire financial statements um, what line items should you forecast out of that? Um, so you want to focus on items which are not calculated. Um, so, uh, like sales should definitely be forecasted, cost of goods sold, SG&A, uh, but not operating profit because operating profit represents sales minus COGS, minus SG&A, minus other operating expenses. Um, and so it's completely calculated from other items. And so you just for forecast those component items, and then you can calculate the operating profit and the forecast. You don't have to forecast it directly. Um, so that means that in your future financial statements, you're going to want to have these items calculated. Um, so, you know, if you're 
doing this in Excel, that's as simple as just calculating them in the historical data, having your forecasted right next to the historical, and then just dragging that over. Um, and then uh, in Python with the fin statement package, um, this is going to be handled automatically for you. Um, and thinking about should I just forecast the levels um, or should I forecast a percentage? Um, so when the two items logically scale together, that's when you want to use a percentage. Um, so we've talked already about this example of cost of goods sold is typically a percentage of sales in the forecast because uh, if the company sells more, they need to buy more inventory in order to sell it and, and go through that whole um, processing process of creating the inventory uh, in order to sell it. Uh, and that's the cost of goods sold. So for each additional unit sold, they have to expend the cost of selling that. And if they sell fewer units, that's also going to be a lower associated cost. And so those two logically scale directly together. And so the uh, COGS should be estimated as a percentage of the sales. Um, and here, interest expense is another good example. Uh, the company pays interest as a percentage on an amount of debt, and so it makes sense for the interest expense to be forecasted as a percentage of the total debt. Um, the long-term debt could also be a reasonable uh, option there for the percentage. Another thing that we have to think about, which is really specific to financial statement forecasting, is that we got to keep the balance sheet balanced. Uh, we know um, from accounting that we always want to have assets equal to liabilities plus equity. And we've got to make sure that relationship um, stays at least close to true in our forecast for it to be somewhat accurate. Um, and so basically the way that you can do this is do your initial forecast and then adjust a couple of line items to make the balance sheet balance. Um, and so if your asset side ends up much greater than your liabilities and equity side, that is um, indicative of, by the way that you've forecasted it, the company doesn't actually have enough funds to finance the, the assets in the company. Uh, so they need to raise those funds by some means, and so usually increasing debt is going to be the solution there. So you're saying in order to support the operations uh, in the forecast that I've made, the company needs to take on additional debt in order to finance those assets. Whereas if the reverse is true and assets are lower than uh, liabilities and equity, but that means that the profit, the retained earnings that have come through, uh, or additional debt, which is forecasted to be taken on, has not uh, been reflected over on the assets side. Uh, that hasn't been deployed into any assets, um, which means that really cash should be increased to account for that. Um, so really there, if your assets are lower, you're going to increase the cash. So... Um, to operationally make this happen, um, again, first run your forecast, then uh, do this balancing adjustment. And <clears throat> these values, the cash and debt that we just mentioned, we usually refer to as plugs uh, because we are uh, just plugging in the values that make the balance sheet balance so that the forecast is valid. So to go about this in Excel, um, you have all your forecasted financial statements and then um, look at the total assets, look at the total liabilities plus equity and take the absolute value of the difference and have that as a new like a difference row. Um, and then if you're only forecasting a single period in the future, then you can use GoalSeek to uh, set that difference to zero. 
Um, and if you've got a multi-year forecast, as you probably do, then uh, you want to use Solver in order to uh, make that happen. Um, so there are plenty of resources out there on Solver. You can feel free to Google about that. Um, but you you have to add that as an Excel add-in, which is built in. Uh, but then you can use it, and you basically just say, take this entire row of these difference values, and I want to minimize that. Um, so then it's going to you know, minimize the total of all of these uh, values, and that's going to, and you're, and you're going to say, you know, adjust cash, adjust debt in order to make this happen. Um, so then it should be able to balance the balance sheet for you. Um, and in Python, um, so it's a similar process, only you would use uh, SciPy's minimize function instead of uh, solver. But if you're using Fence Statement, then this actually is handled automatically for you. Um, so whenever you run a forecast, it first forecasts all the line items, and then it goes through this exact balance sheet balancing process. Um, and by default, it's going to use cash and debt as the plugs, but you actually can change what the plugs are as well. Uh, if you just adjust the forecast configuration, um, you can change to have different line items be the plugs as well. It also defaults to um, making sure that the balance sheet is balanced within 10,000. Um, and you can pass this BS diff max um, to the forecast method in order to change how accurate it should be. So if uh, you know your your statements are in billions, um, then um, ten thousand isn't going to make sense there because that would be within ten trillion. Uh, that gives a ton of flexibility, way too much flexibility. Um, in that case, you may even want to set it to like point zero zero one or something. Um, so it does matter what your units are um, for setting that. But if your units are in dollars. Um, then the default of 10,000 is usually a pretty good choice. Um, and the lower that you set this, the more closely it's going to balance the balance sheet, but the longer it's going to take to go through that process. So that's another trade up there. If you have plenty of time for your forecast, maybe set it lower. If you need to get this forecast done, maybe especially as you're testing things out um, in development and you're running a bunch of different forecasts, maybe set a little bit higher. Um, so that the forecast can run quicker. So that's a quick overview of um, taking this forecasting knowledge that we already know and applying it specifically to free cash flows. Um, so in the next video, we'll come back to just uh, wrap up the DCF model with the last portion about the terminal value. So thanks for listening and see you next time.